This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. The heart longing of every Christian for the last 2,000 years has been to see the Saviour return and set up an everlasting kingdom on earth. Events in the world reveal that this will happen very soon. Keep listening to learn how you can spiritually prepare for earth's final events. WLC Radio, preparing a people for life in Yahweh's earthly kingdom to be established upon Christ's imminent return. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Miles Roby. And I'm Dave Wright. And whether you're listening via shortwave radio or on YouTube, I just want to say I'm really glad that you've joined us today. Yeah, as am I as well. And wow, do we have a program for you today. When Dave first approached me about it and started sharing with me what he'd been studying, well, I have to admit, I was... Um, <laughs> what, aghast, appalled, shocked? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I was quite taken aback, actually. And I think most Christians are aware that in the first few centuries after Christ, paganism entered the Christian church. But honestly, I had no clue the degree to which pagan philosophy corrupted pure apostolic Christianity. And I've studied this before. Even so, I was, I was well, yeah, well, um, really shocked. Really well, shocked. honestly, uh, I was too. So let's get into it. But before we do, I just want to share one word of caution with the listener. The things that we're going to be talking about today are going to shock you if this is the first time you've heard it. That doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means that it's different. It may well contradict what you've been taught is truth, but again, that doesn't mean that it's wrong. When some new idea contradicts what we've been told is the truth, it's easy to just dismiss it without actually looking at the evidence. It's very easy to do that. But just because it's the first time you've heard an idea does not somehow make it wrong by default. So my request is that you listen with an open mind. I'm not asking you to take my word for it. I'm simply mm. asking you to listen to all the evidence with an open mind and then, under the guidance of Yah's spirit, make your own decision. Fair enough? Well, that's fair. It's fair. All right. You talk to any Protestant today and ask him where his beliefs come from and what's he going to say? Well, the Bible, of course. Sola Scriptura, or Scripture alone, was the rallying cry of the Protestant Reformation. Right. And the Roman Catholic Church has always been very open about the weight that it puts on tradition and the writings of the Church Fathers. Protestants, on the other hand, have always said that tradition may be wrong. Go to the Bible and the Bible alone for truth. Mm -hmm. Like Paul wrote to Timothy, all Scripture is given by inspiration of Yah and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of Yah may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we don't need tradition to tell us the truth. Scripture is a sufficient guide. The problem comes in how Scripture is interpreted. Mm, you see, that's where the splits always come. An article on Christian statistics published in 2017 estimated there are approximately 41,000 Christian denominations. 41,000. That's a lot. And they're typically divided over some point of doctrine based on differing interpretations of Scripture. Well, what very few Christians today realise is that modern Christianity itself is very different from the original apostolic Christianity of the first century, and it has to do with how Scripture is interpreted. Modern Christian theology has been heavily, and I do mean heavily, influenced by paganism, especially the writings of the Greek philosopher Plato. What beliefs in particular would you say come from Plato? Well, specifically, that of a triune godhead... And remember, folks, study the evidence before you dismiss it, and the idea of the saved going to heaven. Well, that too. I, I mean, I knew the Trinity came from ancient paganism, but this idea of going to heaven comes from paganism too. Yeah, and it was the so-called church fathers of Christianity that took the scriptures and interpreted them in a way that was consistent with Greek philosophy, an interpretation the apostles never intended. 
Most laymen don't know this, but it is common knowledge to biblical scholars. And I've printed out, actually, a few quotes that I'd like you to read today. Uh, No one has to take my word for it. Just listen to these quotes, and then, if you would, do your own research. So there we are. That's the list. Oh, wow, you've compiled a book. (laughs) Well, like I said, (laughs) scholars know this even if laymen don't. Now, the first quote that you have there is from William Inge. He was dean of St Paul's Cathedral. He was nominated three different times for the Nobel Prize in Literature. He was also Professor of Divinity at Cambridge University. A very well knowledgeable, well-educated man, he sounds like. Well, indeed. So go ahead and just read that first quote there, and let's see what he had to say about Plato's influence on Christianity. OK, it says, quote, Platonism is part of the virtual structure of Christian theology. If people would read Plotinus, who worked to reconcile Platonism with Scripture, they would understand better the real continuity between the old culture and the new religion. They might realise the utter impossibility of excising Platonism from Christianity without tearing Christianity to pieces. That's incredible! Okay, well, keep reading because he's not done yet. Okay. The Galilean Gospel as it proceeded from the lips of Jesus, was doubtless unaffected by Greek philosophy. But early Christianity, from its very beginning, was formed by a confluence of Jewish and Hellenic religious ideas. That's absolutely astonishing. He's not the only one. Have you heard of James Strong? Uh, Sure, he wrote the famous Strong's Concordance of the Bible. Okay, well, read the next quote on that sheet there. Uh, That's what James Strong had to say about Plato's influence on Christianity. Okay, uh, quote, Towards the end of the first century and during the second, many learned men came over both from Judaism and paganism to Christianity. These brought with them into the Christian schools of theology their platonic ideas and phraseology, unquote. Yeah, I can see what's happening. I remember actually at university uh, taking a history course on the development of Western thought. Plato featured prominently in the class curriculum. Could you take a moment to talk about Plato, actually? I think everyone has probably heard his name, but who was he and what did he believe that became so influential in Christianity in the West? Well, Plato was born into a wealthy, aristocratic family somewhere between 428 and 423 BCE, and he died somewhere around 348, 347 BCE, somewhere around there. So, well, definitely a pagan then, in a culture permeated with paganism. Absolutely. Yes, in fact, it was claimed that his own father, Ariston, descended from Codrus, the king of Athens, while his mother, Perictione, came from a family who was close friends with the famous Athenian lawmaker, Solon. Wasn't he one of the seven sages? Yes, he was, and her brothers also prominent in the politics of ancient Athens. So very influential on both sides of the family then. Which, of course, would have an impact on his education. Plato himself was influenced by pagan philosophers like Heraclitus and the Pythagoreans. Socrates too, right? Yes, in fact, Socrates, along with the Pythagoreans, had probably the greatest influence on Plato out of them all. After Socrates died, Plato established an academy that attracted some of the brightest minds of the day in philosophy mathematics and astronomy and one of Socrates' students was Aristotle who's famous in his own right. I read a treatise called The Hermeneutics of the Subject where the author Michel Foucault said that Plato was one of the founders of Western religion and Western spirituality. Absolutely and the thing that I want to make clear is that Plato was steeped in pagan thought. His worldview was pagan through and through. One idea that Plato is especially known for is a dualistic worldview. Oh, and what do you mean by that? Well, basically, it's this idea that the world in which we're living is an imperfect copy of a higher world where everything, whether an actual form or a mere idea, exists in an ideal state. Uh, Well... I don't know about you, but I think my current state is quite ideal. (laughs) So if I asked your wife, would she agree with you? Uh... (laughs) But of course. (laughs) Well, you see, but Plato would beg to differ. He'd say, you're but a pale imitation of the ideal you which exists in the higher world. This ultimate ideal form, Plato claimed, was an impersonal force that he called the good. And if you want to read up on that, it's called the theory of forms. Mm. I'll pass. Anyway, uh, 
<laughs> what I'd like to know is how Plato's beliefs influenced the early church fathers. You, you did say that modern Christianity is still moulded by Plato, and I'd like to hear some more uh, specific examples of how his beliefs differed from Scripture. All right. Well, Heraclitus of Ephesus, one of the philosophers that influenced Plato, is credited with being the first person to apply the word logos, which means word, to divine wisdom or reason. Heraclitus taught that this logos was a power that served to coordinate the universe. Plato built on this idea, claiming that the logos was part of a divine triad which was made up of the good the Logos, or Word, and what he referred to as the World Spirit. Sounds like anything you know? Yeah, that sounds like what Christianity teaches about triune Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, or the Word of God, and God the Holy Spirit. Right, and this is one of the areas from which this concept of a three-in-one Godhead came. Now understand, Plato didn't think the Logos was a literal person. Instead, he viewed it as a guiding principle. The later Stoic philosophers believed the Logos was the account which governs everything. Aristotle, Plato's student, if you recall, didn't buy into everything about Plato's theory of forms, but he did believe in a triad too. If you can go ahead there and just read that next quote that I've printed out, and this is Aristotle writing here. All right, okay. As for the Pythagoreans, say the world and all that is in it is determined by the number three since beginning and middle and end give the number of an all, and the number they give is the triad. And so, having taken these three from nature as, so to speak, laws of it, we make further use of the number three in the worship of the gods. Eventually, over the course of several centuries, this divine triad morphed into the idea of a triune god. This is the main area in which Christianity was influenced by Plato. You have to understand that the early church fathers were well-educated men. Many of them had, as well-educated men did in those times, been trained in Greek philosophy. This naturally influenced their interpretation of Scripture. Oh, so, so what you're saying is they form their world view from the Greek perspective rather than the actual Jewish perspective. Precisely. Even though Scripture was written from the Jewish point of view. So when these so-called church fathers came along, they interpreted Scripture not from the Jewish perspective of the writers, but from the point of view of their Greek education. For example, they said that Plato's good was, of course, Yahuwah. The Logos, they claimed, was Yahushua, and the world spirit was a suddenly disembodied third person of a mystical godhead. So Plato's divine triad morphed into Christianity's trinity through classically educated church fathers. This had to have a a huge impact on every area of Christian belief. Believe me, it did. Uh, Do you know Edward Gibbon? Uh, Yes, he wasn't he the bloke that wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire? Yes, and he wrote another one entitled History of Christianity. Now, in there, he discusses the Greek philosophies that influenced early Christianity. In fact, look at that next quote there. This is Gibbon writing there. Okay, it says, quote, If paganism was conquered by Christianity, it is equally true that Christianity was corrupted by paganism. The pure deism of the first Christians was changed by the Church of Rome into the incomprehensible dogma of the Trinity. Many of the pagan tenets, invented by the Egyptians and idealised by Plato, were attained as being worthy of belief. By pure deism, Gibbon was referring to the basic religion of the apostles that believed in one God. They, like the Jews before them, were pure monotheists. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6, mm. verse 4, would you please? Now, this bit is called the Shema. It's the foundation upon which the entire Jewish religion was based. And this same belief was foundational to apostolic Christianity too. You got it there. Right, go ahead. Mm. Hear, O Israel, Yahuwah our God is one Lord. Now, in the translation there that you read from, the verb is, is a supplied word. So okay. just read it again. This time, leave out that verb. Verb. Okay. Hear, O Israel, Yahuwah, our God, one Lord. The uh. apostolic Christians there, like the Jews, were monotheists. They worshipped Yahuwah as the one and only true and living God. They certainly did not worship him as a three in one with the Son and the Holy Spirit. The doctrine of the Trinity simply does not appear 
in Scripture. Even Trinitarian scholars admit this. Now, the next quote on that sheet in front of you there, Miles, is from a Baptist theologian by the name of William N. Clark. Just go ahead and read for us what he says. All right. Speaking of Scripture, he says, quote, The word Trinity is never used, and there is no indication that the idea of Trinity had taken form. It has long been a common practice to read the New Testament as if the ideas of a later age upon this subject were in it, but they are not. In the days of the apostles, the doctrine of the Trinity was yet to be created. After the lapse of three or four centuries, there was wrought a doctrine of the Trinity. This historic doctrine differed widely from the simplicity of the early faith. Unquote. You see, that's an amazing statement. Yeah, yeah. Um, before you go on, Dave, I just want to share one point with our listeners. I mean, a lot of you may be thinking, how can you say the doctrine of the Trinity doesn't appear in Scripture? It does in First John. Now, I've pulled that up here, so let me please read it for you. It's First John uh, chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. It says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. You're right. And this passage mm -hmm. is frequently pointed to as proof of a triune Godhead. But, but it's not. No. It doesn't appear in any of the earliest manuscripts. In fact, it wasn't until over a thousand years later that these verses were added to the Bible. So, yeah, I mean, the doctrine of a trinity simply does not exist in Scripture. No, nope, it really doesn't. Just to pull up Mark chapter 12, would you please? Mm -hmm. Here a scribe came to Yahushua and asked, What is the greatest commandment of them all? Now, Miles, if you could read Yahushua's answer and what the scribe said in response, this is very revealing. Mark chapter 12, verses 29 to 33. Okay. Yahushua answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, Yahuwah our God. Yahuwah is one. And you shall love Yahuwah your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. So here, Yahushua is asked, What's the greatest commandment? And the Saviour quotes the Shema, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. So they knew this passage, and they were not believers in a Platonic trinity. Read the next verse now, and let's see what Yahushua says to the scribe. Now when Yahushua saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of Yah. Yahushua here is asserting what the Jews had always believed. There was only one God, and that God was Yahuwah. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. Let's just talk about this some more when we come back. Just stay tuned. If you would like to hear past episodes of WLC Radio, you can find them on our website at worldslastchance.com or look for them on YouTube. Who would have thought that Plato, of all people, but have such long-lasting impact on the Christian perception of Yahuwah. Well, it's not only Yahuwah, but Yahushua too. Yes, Plato's view on the divine triad and the Logos laid the foundation from which the church fathers extrapolated to form a triune godhead. But he also influenced how Christians to this day view the nature of Christ. How so, though? Plato believed that every soul is not only eternal, but also each one was also pre-existent before being incarnated. You're not just speaking of Yahushua here, though. No, Plato believed that everyone pre-existed before being incarnated at birth. This belief is directly responsible for the widely held belief in Christendom that Yahushua was pre-existent. The Church Fathers were what we call Hellenized, meaning that their thought, their education, was shaped by Greek philosophy. So when reading the Gospel accounts, 
they superimposed this belief system onto what they were reading. And that's where we get this idea that Yahushua became incarnate in Mary's womb after having had a pre-existent life in heaven. But the Hebrews didn't believe in the pre-existence of the soul. No, of course not. Instead, they believed in, and you can find this throughout Scripture, the pre-existence of a divine plan through Yahweh's foreknowledge. Big difference, then. It is. Scripture does not teach that Yahushua pre-existed before being conceived in Mary's womb. If you think it does, that is because the interpretation of Scripture you were taught was the interpretation developed by these early church fathers whose thinking was shaped by Plato. All scripture teaches is that we were foreknown by Yahweh as part of his plan. That's it. Mars, could you just turn to Psalm 139, please? This is just one of many instances where the Bible refers to Yah's foreknowledge. So it's, sorry, Psalm 139. Yes, verses uh, 15 and 16, please. Okay, right. It says, My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Another way the Bible refers to this foreknowledge is by saying something was in the mind of Yah from the foundation of the world. It's in this sense that the New Testament refers to Yahushua. Under the influence of Platonic ideas, the Church Fathers claimed that Yahushua literally existed in heaven before his being born, but the Israelite view was that he existed only in Yahweh's plan from the foundation of the world. Turn now to 1 Peter chapter 1 and read verse 20 for us, please, Mars. Okay. Uh, in this context, it's talking about Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times. Now turn to the second chapter of Acts and read verses 22 to 23. This is Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. And what does it say? Men of Israel, hear these words. Yahushua of Nazareth, a man attested by Yahweh to you by miracles, wonders and signs which Yah did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of Yahweh, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. Peter could have said that Yahushua had existed in heaven prior to being incarnated into human flesh. He certainly had the vocabulary to do so. But this idea of a pre-existence followed by an incarnation comes from Plato. Peter's theology was influenced by the Old Testament prophets, not Plato. Turn now to Jeremiah chapter 1, and let's read verses 4 and 5. Okay, it says, Then the word of Yahuwah came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. This is Hebrew theology, not pagan theology. And the words said to Jeremiah have a secondary application to Yahushua. Let's take a look now at the church fathers. It's wild to think that pagan philosophy could have such an impact on the early church. Yeah, but it did. Just turn over, mm -hmm. in fact, to the next page on that sheet. Uh, this first quote is by the renowned church historian Philip Schaeff. Just go ahead and read what he has to say about the platonic perversion of Christianity. Okay, it says, Many of the early Christians found peculiar attractions in the doctrines of Plato and employed them as weapons for the defence and extension of Christianity, or cast the truths of Christianity in a platonic mould. The doctrines of the Logos and the Trinity receive their shape from Greek fathers who, if not trained in the schools, were much influenced directly or indirectly by the Platonic philosophy, particularly in its Jewish Alexandrian form. That errors and corruptions crept into the church from this source cannot be denied. Among the most illustrious of the fathers, who were more or less Platonic, may be named Justin Martyr. Athenagorius, Theophilus, Irenaeus, Hippolytus, Clement of Alexandria, Oregon, Minucius Felix, Eusebius, Methodius, Basil the Great, Gregory of Nyssa, and St. Augustine. That's quite a list, isn't it? In the entry for Athenagoras of Athens, the Encyclopaedia Britannica states his theology is strongly tinged with Platonism, whilst the Encyclopaedia Americana says, quote, 
Athenagoras frequently combined the beliefs of the Greek poets and philosophers, particularly Plato, with the doctrines of Christianity. Now let's take a look at what some of the church fathers themselves had to say. The next quote down there, could you read that for us? Okay, this is from Augustine of Hippo. He says, The utterance of Plato, the most pure and bright in all philosophy, scattering the clouds of error. Wow. If you didn't know better, you'd think he was speaking of scripture there. Mm. In his book, The Passion of the Western Mind, Richard Tarnus wrote, quote, It was Augustine's formulation of Christian Platonism that was to permeate virtually all of medieval Christian thought in the West. So enthusiastic was the Christian integration of the Greek spirit that Socrates and Plato were frequently regarded as divinely inspired pre-Christian saints. Seriously, wow. Oh, yes. And in fact, Clement of Alexandria... Have you heard of him? Uh, yeah. Well, in the Journal of Religion, Albert Outler writes that Plato, quote, occupies a crucial place in what is called the Hellenization of Christianity. It is generally recognized that Clement went as far as any Orthodox Christian ever did in appropriation and use of Hellenistic, philosophical and ethical concepts for the expression of his Christian faith. Plato was his favorite philosopher. I read recently that Clement believed that Greek philosophy was a sort of tutor to prepare the Greeks to accept Yahushua. Yes. The problem with that, though, rather than laying pagan philosophy aside when the truth was revealed, they instead integrated pagan philosophy into Christian theology. And, and that's why it's in Christianity to this day. Exactly. Now, what's the next name on your list, though? Uh, it says Gregory of Nyssa. Gregory of Nyssa was a 4th century bishop who was influential in developing the doctrine of a triune godhead at the Council of Constantinople in 381 CE. The Great Catechism states that he, quote, described Christ's saving work in the language of Platonic forms. That's interesting, because this quote is from The Philosophy of the Church Fathers by Harry Wolfson. Oh, yes. Now, he's talking about the compromise that was needed when Gregory tried to harmonise Greek philosophy with Israelite monotheism. In fact, go mm. ahead and read it for us. It's a solution by harmonisation, an attempt to combine, as Gregory of Nyssa characterises it, the monotheism of the Jews and the polytheism of the Greeks, the method of harmonization used by them was to thin down the Jewish monotheism as a concession to Greek philosophy. Talk about a corruption of apostolic Christianity. And mm -hmm. don't kid yourself, it was corruption, plain and simple. By interpreting scripture from the perspective of a pagan philosopher, the original meaning and intent of the Bible is lost. This became so pervasive that many of the church fathers taught that a believer could actually grow in the knowledge of Yah through a study of Greek philosophy. Incredible, isn't it? Really is. That's the exact opposite of what Paul said. Give me just a quick second here just to look this up. I think it's in, yes it is, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 to 23. So this is what it says. Where is the wise... Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not Yah made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of Yah, the world through wisdom did not know Yahweh, it pleased Yah through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. So, hardly a way to learn of Yah. Paul actually warned against pagan philosophy. In fact, can you just read from Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 for us? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, interesting, actually, in this version, the supplied subtitle of the chapter says, Not philosophy, but Christ. Mm. <laughs> okay, Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. It says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Paul was the most well-educated of the apostles. He knew that pagan philosophy would only corrupt the nascent faith, and he warned against it. Unfortunately, as the church fathers merged Christian theology with pagan philosophy, they developed the belief of a triune godhead which is diametrically opposed to the pure monotheism of Scripture. Now, the next quote there, could you read that? It's from Old Testament scholar Norman Snaith. And what does he say? He says, quote, Our position is that the 
reinterpretation of biblical theology in terms of the ideas of the Greek philosophers has been both widespread throughout the centuries and everywhere destructive to the essence of the Christian faith. Christianity itself has tended to suffer from a translation out of the prophets and into Plato. We're not to be bound to unbelievers. Do you remember Paul's admonition in 2 Corinthians? Uh... No. <laughs> All right. Well, let's read it. Second Corinthians chapter 6, uh, verses 14 to 15. Okay. It says, oh, yeah. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? We are to go to Scripture, not pagan philosophy for our theology. Jude could even see it starting to creep in in his day. Uh, Read Jude chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord, Yahushua Christ. The apostles were monotheists, not Trinitarians. Now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and read verse 6 for us. For us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord, Yahushua Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. So the question for each one of us is, who are you going to believe? The church fathers corrupted by pagan philosophy or the Bible? Even Christ said that there was only one God. In John 17 verse 3, he prayed, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God. Earlier you said that Platonic philosophy even shaped Christianity's view of heaven. Could you speak more of that, please? Yes, of course. Most Christians today view heaven as an ethereal place where disembodied spirits while away eternity gazing upon Yahweh. This again comes from Plato. Remember his idea that the physical world is but an inferior reflection of the perfect ideal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, heaven for Plato then was to escape the physical material world which he viewed as imperfect. He believed that the human soul is trapped within a physical body. That right there is a contradiction to the Bible which states that when the breath of Yah entered the body of Adam, man became a living soul. It's the combination of the two, isn't it? Right, but to Plato, the body was like the soul's prison. Salvation, then, was to escape the physical realm and go to the spiritual realm. That belief is actually the basis of Plato's phrase soma sema, which means that the body is a prison or even a tomb for the soul. Believers even speak of the spiritual bodies they expect to receive, but the Bible's descriptions of the reward that awaits the righteous is actually a physical restoration of the earth and our physical bodies. Yeah, it's it's the restoration of life on the earth made new that's the Christian's hope. It's the overarching theme throughout Scripture. At the fall, Yahweh did what besides drive Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden? Uh, He cursed the ground. Exactly. And the reward of the righteous will be to have the curse lifted, living for all eternity on a recreated earth in the presence of the Father and the Lamb. Turn now to Romans chapter 8 and read verses 18 to 23. Nobody puts this concept to words quite like Paul. Uh, Just read that for us, Mars, please. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of Yah. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of Yahweh. For we know that the whole creation groans and labours with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Does that sound like some mystical reward in some ethereal realm with spiritual bodies? Not even a little. At creation, Yahweh pronounced the earth and everything in it good. His very words contain the power to do what he says. 
so the physical, material world was indeed good when he pronounced it to be so. This is in direct contradiction to Platonic ideology. The Messiah was promised to redeem mankind, his mission, as explained by John the Beloved in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, was to destroy or undo the works of the devil. Back to the Church Fathers. Saint Augustine is one of the most widely known of these early leaders. And there's a quote there by author Benedict Vivano I'd like you to read that explains this. We need only note that Augustine was strongly influenced by Neoplatonic philosophy. This philosophy was highly spiritual and otherworldly, centred on the one and the eternal, treating the material and the historically contingent as inferior stages in the ascent of the soul to union with the one. Again, a spiritual reward on an ethereal plane is not the reward promised in Scripture. And to close, Miles, would you please read the description of the reward promised in Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 4. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from Yah out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Yah is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and Yahuwah himself shall be with them, and be their God. And Yahuwah shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ at 9330 kHz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Prior to the early 20th century, whenever people referred to the Sabbath, they generally were not referring to Saturday. Instead, when they spoke of the Sabbath, most Christians were talking about Sunday. Today, things are different. Most Christians today insist that the day itself does not matter since, they say, they worship every day and merely celebrate the resurrection on Sunday. The truth is, the precise day does matter and Satan knows this. Special blessings are reserved for those who lay aside their normal round of activities and spend time with their maker. To learn more, visit worldslastchance.com and click on the WLC radio icon. Look for the episode, The War for Worship. You can also look for it on YouTube. So, where's today's daily mailbag coming from, Miles? I'll give you a hint. This country has the longest place name in the world. Ah, okay. Well, mm, I'm probably going to say Germany because they tend to glom or join together words which make really long place names. Yes. Good guess, but no price for you. (laughs) Uh, the The word contains 85 letters. Wow, seriously? And what is it? (laughs) <laughs> you really expect me to be able to pronounce this yeah, one? come on. But I, I struggle at most times, to be honest. <laughs> uh, listen, all I can tell you is it starts with Tau and ends with huh. It's a hill in Hawke's Bay, New Zealand. And the name translates to something like the summit where Tamatea, the man with the big knees, the climber of mountains, the land swallower who travelled about, played his nose flute, to his loved one. Interesting. Yeah, well, at least it's a place name and not a person's name. <laughs> so uh, that's where our question is coming from today. Yeah, yeah, Hawke's Bay. Uh, no, but uh, New Zealand, actually. Uh, Janet from Rotorora in New Zealand has a great question for us. I think uh, it's one we can all relate to. And she says, quote, Dear Dave and Miles, It seems the older I get, the more I struggle with anxiety. I wake up at two or three in the morning and can't get back to sleep. Worrying about my grown kids, my job, the health of my elderly parents, you name it. I'm worrying about it. And the state of the world right now isn't helping matters. Do you have any words of wisdom that can help me? Well, first let me say I understand. I believe there are two reasons why, as we get older, we suffer from anxiety more. The first is simply life experience. We've seen disasters happen. We've experienced disasters happening. 
Yeah, uh, when we're young, it's easy to view disasters as something that happens to someone else. But you get more life experience and you realise disasters can happen to anyone at any time. And that's personal. When you stop and look around, when you see what's happening in the world today, there's even more to be anxious about. Mm, absolutely, there is. Anxiety is defined as apprehension about future uncertainties. None of us can know the future. So... What do we do for anxiety then? Well, we may not know the future, but we know who holds the future, and that's our loving Heavenly Father. And there's a verse that I'd like you to read, Miles. It's found in Isaiah chapter 26, and this text holds the key to how you handle anxiety. It's Isaiah chapter 26, and it's verse 3, please, Miles. Sure, it says, quote, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. When we make it a habit to trust our Heavenly Father, the fears and anxieties that plague us as we get older will fade when we remember who is in control. OK, Miles, turn now to Jeremiah chapter 29. Actually, just one, one second before you go on. I just want to read the, the next verse if I can. It's really beautiful okay. too. And it says... Trust ye in Yahuwah forever, for in Yahuwah, Jehovah is everlasting strength. See what I mean? The very time to trust is when you're feeling afraid. And like we hear every day with the daily promises, Yahuwah is safe to trust. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go ahead now. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. Yep. And it is when we remember that the Almighty is a tender, loving parent that we can safely trust in his wise plans for us. Now, you got it there? Okay, off yes. you go. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith Yahweh, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. The Father's plans towards us are for our good. Even when things seem to be falling down around our ears, we can trust in the love and compassion of our Heavenly Father. He wants to make us happy. He only allows that which can be used for our eternal good, and when we suffer, He suffers. Yeah, I see Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. He is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. You said there was a second reason, though, why we suffer from anxiety. And what, what was that? Well, I recently read a book by a medical doctor who specialised in allergies. Uh, it's Dr. William Walsh. The book was entitled How I Recovered from Dementia. The title makes it sound like a memoir, but actually it's not. In his many decades as a doctor specialising in treating allergies, Dr Walsh discovered certain chemicals that are often naturally occurring as well as being added to food that have the effect of keeping us awake at night as we age. Mm. And then, of course, uh, with our life experience, we get thinking about all the things that could go wrong and anxiety keeps us awake. Exactly right. And when you're young, most people aren't as affected by these chemicals. Now, what Dr. Walsh discovered was that eliminating or strictly limiting these chemicals in our diet helps people sleep through the night and lessens brain fog. And for him, it actually reversed developing dementia. So there are a lot of health benefits by eating a careful diet. Now, what were the chemicals? OK, well, monosodium glutamate was one. Right. MSG is actually naturally occurring in many foods, but it's also added as a flavour enhancer. Refined sugars, all refined sugars, not just white sugar, gluten, lactose, uh, let me think, what else? Oh, one that surprised me was citrus acids. Wow. He discovered that limiting or removing these from the diet had benefits in managing nerve-related diseases such as Huntington's disease, ALS, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, even migraines and brain fog. Wow. What was the name of the book again? How I Recovered from Dementia. Now, it's told in layman's language, so it's easy to understand, but it also explains the science behind it, which, to be honest, I found the most interesting. No, it's very good to know. I think I think it's part of our responsibility as a Christian, though, to eat a healthy diet so our body temples can uh, be fit habitations for your spirit. It's amazing that removing these chemicals from the diet improved insomnia and also nightly anxiety too. Mm. Uh, that's all we've got time for today. Really enjoyed receiving your messages, of course. If you've got any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. Go to our website at worldslastchance.com and click on Contact Us. Now, we might not be able to address everything on air, but at least we'll try and get it addressed in our Q&As on our website. Hello, this is Elise O'Brien with your Daily Promise from Yah's Word. 
Joshua Rogers is a writer and Christian columnist. While a poor young law student, he was given a $50 ticket for driving with an expired license. The police officer told him that if he obtained a new license within two days, he wouldn't have to pay the ticket. $50 was way more than Joshua could afford, so he went to the Department of Motor Vehicles to renew his driver's license. After waiting an hour and a half to be seen, he made it to the counter, had his picture taken, and filled out the paperwork. That'll be $22, the clerk told him. 22, Joshua exclaimed. I thought it was only 17. It was, the clerk said. Now it's 22. The problem was, Joshua didn't have $22. He was $5 short. The clerk agreed to hold his application while he ran out to his car to look for some loose change. Digging under the seats and in the glove compartment, Joshua was able to come up with a dollar twenty-four. Still, three dollars and seventy-six cents short. Joshua felt desperate. If he didn't have three dollars and seventy-six cents, he certainly didn't have fifty dollars to pay for the ticket if he couldn't get his license renewed. In desperation, he prayed to Yahweh. Father, he said, could you please give me four dollars? Like, could you just make it appear somewhere? Getting out of his car, he looked around on the ground, hoping to find some change. Nothing. He would have to go back in and tell the clerk that he wasn't going to be able to pay for his license. Just then, a brown-haired woman in a blue truck drove up and parked. The woman got out and immediately walked over to Joshua. Looking right in his eyes, she asked, Do you need something? Joshua was shocked. Stammering a little, he said, Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I do. If you don't mind, I mean... I actually need four, four dollars. He tried to explain the situation, but before he had even finished, the woman had taken the money out of her wallet and was pressing it into his hand. In thinking back to that day, Joshua says, quote, To this day, I marvel that the lady so boldly approached me in the parking lot. Though she didn't directly hear my prayer, Yah must have somehow shared the request with her, and thankfully she was listening closely enough to hear his concern for my relatively minor need. If she were like a lot of us, she might have ignored that prompting from Yah. It wouldn't have been big enough. We want to change the world, to prove how big our God is, how big his plans are. But even a small task is big if it's his will. I prayed for four dollars, and Yahweh used a seemingly random lady to provide. But through her obedience, he provided more than pocket change. He showed me how much he loves me, that he cares about the details of my life, and that he sends people along to meet even my most basic needs. Unquote. Second Samuel chapter 22 verse 7 tells us, In my distress I called upon Yahweh and cried out to my Eloah. He heard my voice from his temple and my cry entered his ears. We have been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. I have to say, Dave, that today's topic is shocking, to say the least. The more that truth is restored, the more opportunities you have to see how Satan has covered up truth. And it's easy to think that I, I can't be surprised by any more, but then a topic like today's comes along and I realize I could still be shocked at the degree to which modern Christianity has strayed from pure apostolic Christianity. And it actually reminds me of the Saviour's words in Luke 18, where he asked, When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Oh, he'll find faith, all right. But how many who claim to be believers, how many who take the name of Christ and call themselves Christians will have a pure faith, an apostolic faith, uncorrupted by paganism, by humanism, by Darwinism, by all the multitudinous ways the devil has sought to lead people astray over the last two millennia? How many do you think? Well, not many. No, not many at all. And that brings me to the point that I'd actually like to conclude on today. Folks, keep studying. Don't assume all truth has been revealed or that you know all truth. You see, Satan has spent the last 6,000 years corrupting, twisting and outright burying truth. We're not going to know it all this side of eternity. To assume we know all truth necessary in order to be saved is actually to close our minds to new truth that heaven is pouring out. 
I think that's why in Revelation 18, believers are called out of Babylon. Let me just quickly read it for you. This is Revelation 18, verses 4 and 5, and I'm, I'm reading from the Geneva Bible here, the Bible of the Protestant Reformers, and it says, quote, And I heard another voice from heaven say, Go out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receiveth not of her plagues. For her sins are come up into heaven, and Yah hath remembered her iniquities. Like you've pointed out before, Dave, the typical translation of come out of her is an invitation, but it's actually a command. Go, get out. Well, you see why, don't you? Because all organised religions have their truth entwined with error. Yes, but, but actually more than that is that all organised religions, all Christian denominations have creeds and unique sets of belief. It's what sets them apart as different from other denominations and other religions. In order to be a member of that particular religion or denomination, you have to adhere to that set of beliefs. That's true. The problem is that with a creed comes the mindset that everyone else is wrong and only your denomination is mm. right. Now, this has the effect of closing the mind to new truths. Now, your organisation may indeed have a lot of truth, but what if Yah wants to bring you more? Are you going to reject it because it contradicts your denomination's creed or your religion's theology? That's the danger that comes with aligning ourselves with religious organisations. As soon as we join a particular church, we tend to start letting the pastor or priest tell us what to believe, and we stop studying for ourselves. We mm. can't do that. We're too near the end to assume we know it all or to let others think for us. Yeah, religious leaders can be Satan's most efficient henchmen. Mm. They can influence so many more than the average person. Right. In fact, turn to Joel chapter 2 and read verse 23 for us, please. It says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in Yahuwah your Elohar, for he hath given you the former reign moderately. And he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. Scripture interprets itself. We know from elsewhere in Scripture that rain is a symbol for doctrine. So the disciples and apostles received the early rain. Now it's time for the latter rain. That is an increase of pure doctrine. You're not going to know it if you don't study for it and study for yourself. And it's exciting to learn new truths. It is. There's nothing else in life quite as satisfying as discovering new truths out of Yah's word. Well, we're out of time today, and it's gone by quick, hasn't it, again? I want to thank you for joining us today. Time is short, and we need to get ready. There's no time to toy with pet sins, and there's certainly no time to be content with a theology that has been corrupted by error. If you ask Yah to lead you into all truth... He will. He's promised to. We hope you can join us again tomorrow. And until then, remember, Yahuwah loves you. And he is safe to trust. Thank you for listening to this episode on WLC Radio. We're living in very solemn times. The world is hovering on the brink of disaster. Catastrophic events will soon take place that will bring this age to a close and usher in the next. In his great mercy, Yahuwah has revealed through prophecy what the future holds. Revelation 8 foretells a series of events, each one worse than the last, that will devastate the earth. The world's food supplies will be decimated. Famine and its accompanying pestilence will result. The Earth's fresh water supplies will also be affected. Revelation 9 reveals that demons will impersonate extraterrestrials. The terror and devastation of this so-called alien invasion will make people desperate for safety at any cost. The freedom to live and worship as the conscience dictates will become a thing of the past. Many lives will be lost during this series of events, and when the mark of the beast is enforced, there will be martyrs. Each event prepares for the next crisis. In one long last call of mercy to repent, 
For Yahuwah is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Shortly following the events described in Revelation 8 and 9, the seven last plagues will be poured out. These plagues and the earlier trumpets will wreak havoc on the earth and cause unprecedented destruction and misery. Isaiah 24 warns, quote, Behold, Yahuwah maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again." Unquote. For believers, however, there is hope. In describing the end of this age, Yahushua said in Luke 21 verse 28, quote, When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Unquote. Yes, the end will be traumatic. It's meant to be. Yahuwah wants to save every individual he can, so he allows this final climax to awaken souls. But the gospel of the kingdom of Yah is that, beyond the traumatic events of the near future, an eternity of bliss awaits all who accept Yah's gift of salvation. When Yahushua returns, all who've died trusting in the merits of the crucified and risen Savior will be raised back to life in the first resurrection. Yahushua will then set up Yah's kingdom on earth. He and the redeemed will reign jointly on the earth for the first thousand years of eternity. John saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. If you wish to join with the redeemed of all ages, living a life that measures with the life of Yahuwah, make the choice. Accept salvation today. You don't have to get yourself ready. The truth is, you can't. Neither can I. No one can. Come to Him just as you are. Don't wait until you've quit sinning. You're not going to get better through your own efforts. Accept Yahuwah's invitation to become a member of His eternal earthly kingdom. When you accept this precious invitation, Yahuwah will gift you with a brand new heart. In Ezekiel 36, verse 26, he declares, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Accepting this priceless gift is the only way for joining his kingdom. Come to Yahuwah just as you are. He's waiting with arms wide open, eager to receive all who come to him. You have been listening to WLC Radio. World's Last Chance is committed to bringing the gospel of the Kingdom of Yah to the world. Prophecy and current events indicate the Saviour will return in the very near future. This will be followed by gifting the saints with immortality and setting up Yah's kingdom here on earth. There's no time to waste. Accept the gift of salvation today and allow Yahuwah to cover you with the righteousness of Christ. This programme, as well as past episodes of Radio WLC, are available on our website at worldslastchance.com. Click on the Radio WLC icon at the top right of the homepage. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 9330 kHz on the 31 meter band. WLC Radio, preparing a people for life in Yahuwah's earthly kingdom to be established upon Christ's imminent return.